All right, we're live. Live for me, anyway. All right, this one's probably going to be titled something like um, Pauline Anomalies. Pauline Anomalies, because Paul... Paul is a lot more controversial than most people think, because his writings make up one half of the New Testament. Yeah, I mean, you would think that if all the apostles were on the same page and all of them were producing material, even if they weren't writing, they were giving sermons, much like uh, Plato, much like Aristotle, much like so many other historic figures would give speeches, other people would find these things important and would write them down. Those things should be preserved, and yet they're not. What is preserved by and large in the New Testament is Pauline literature. So you would think that there'd be more of a variety. This always bothered me, uh, even as a young teenager, reading and realizing that most of this, most of this New Testament was never intended to be a book. Um, most of it was just personal correspondence from Paul. And even then, not correspondence to Paul, you're only getting half the conversation. You just get uh, Paul's Paul's personal correspondence to the churches of the Mediterranean. So, the writings of Paul being so central, if you can comprehend Paul, you can probably comprehend Christianity. And what, what I've said in recent videos is that there was a, at least an informal schism between uh, those of Paul and those of James. And so Paul becomes... Uh, the locus, you could say, the core of Gentile Christianity. James is uh, Judaic Christianity. And their Gospels don't mesh. Their Gospels don't mesh by and large because of Paul's attitude towards the law. So there's anomalies in Paul as he relates to the other members of the apostolic uh, cohort. And he has kind of a lone wolf generates his own body of literature that then become about half of the New Testament. It looks like a Pauline hijacking of what was originally um, a nearly exclusively Jewish movement, a religious movement. I think it's safe to say, I think it's fair to say that without Paul, you don't have modern Christianity. Uh, Christianity as we know it today, as it moved through history, as it became the faith of the empire as it became the foundation, uh, the, the civil foundation of the West post, post the collapse of Rome. Um, as it moves into the Reformation, borrowing very heavily from the Catholic tradition, you don't, you don't get that type of Christianity if you follow only the Hebraic writings. Um, it's, it's Paul, it's Pauline's, it's the Pauline gospel, the Pauline epistles that uh, serve as the, the foundation and the backbone of what we call Christianity today. So when I talk about Pauline anomalies, I'm talking about things in Paul that defy our notions of who Paul is and what he's supposed to be. So what is Paul supposed to be? He's supposed to be an apostle, and the apostles are largely held to be infallible, particularly when they write, and particularly when those writings are canonical. So they're infallible. Well, we know that Apostles aren't necessarily infallible because otherwise Paul would never have rebuked Peter in the book of Galatians. Paul recounts rebuking Peter in the city of Damascus because he returned to his Judaizing ways in respect to his diet as soon as um, Christians from, from Jerusalem came to the city. Paul rebukes him. So we know that the, the apostles are not infallible. <laughs> They make mistakes, and the question is now, do they ever make mistakes in their writings? And if they were free to make mistakes in their writings, was the church free to canonize writings with mistakes in them? And, I mean, just on its surface, if you look at the New Testament, the, the basic incoherence of the gospel of James versus the gospel of Paul, I think, leads any rational person to the conclusion that, in fact, the canon does include statements of error from the apostles. Well, that, that seems radical, maybe to some, but, you know, that 
beginning with the, the German theologians of the, the Reformation or you know, one generation after the Reformation, the critical historical method of, of looking at the scriptures demonstrated much of this two or three hundred years ago. And so this is not that radical amongst progressives. This is radical amongst fundamentalists. But let's get into it. Just a couple of Pauline anomalies here. Um, Paul says that he was taught directly by Christ. So we'll go to that real quick. So he didn't learn his gospel from the other apostles. He said that... Hmm, uh, verse 12 of Galatians chapter 1, For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, um, you know from reading other parts of Paul that Paul was struck down on the road to Damascus and met Christ personally. He also says that he went into Arabia for, some people say, 14 years and was taught of Christ there. Um, he was certainly brought up into the third heavens, as he says, I think, in 1 Corinthians. And so he has all these opportunities to learn directly from the Son of God. And so his gospel, he says, came directly from Christ, but he teaches far more than the gospel. He also teaches a lot of eschatology. And so what is Paul's view of the eschaton? Um, what does Paul believe about it? Well, much that the Old Testament teaches about the day of the Lord being a time of judgment um, he also says to us in Thessalonians, talks about the man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition, who will sit himself in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And the temple of God to the Jews at this time could be none other than the temple in Jerusalem. So when he wrote that, no, no doubt the temple was still standing. It had not yet been destroyed. Um, but the, the assumption would be that uh, the Antichrist would seat himself on the Ark of the Covenant, and if you could do that without being struck dead, then you were no doubt God himself. And so that's the picture of the eschaton to Paul, the revelation of the man of sin, and which would instigate um, a great delusion, falling away, and then uh, God's judgment. He also, in, I think it's 2 Thessalonians, talks about a type of rapture in which those who are alive and remain will be caught up in the clouds. Um, the timing of this event, Paul does seem to indicate throughout all of his writings, is very near, like within Paul's lifetime. Because when he talks about uh, those who are alive and remain, he uses the, the pronoun we. We who are alive and remain. He's assuming he'll be one of those who are alive and will be caught up into the clouds. He tells those who are married, he says, those who have wives should be as though they had none, because the day approaches. Um, he says that the day of the Lord is at hand. He says the day is far spent, and now draws the time because our, the day of our salvation is closer than when we first believed. Now, all of these statements from Paul are statements of imminence, not something that's supposed to be 2,000 years down the road, something that is going to happen in his lifetime. And so, in all of his conversations with Jesus that he claims to have had, apparently, the Lord's return was either never discussed, or when it was discussed, Paul was given wrong impressions that he was then free to pass on to the rest of Christendom, the rest of the Christian world. Imagine being that guy or that girl listening to the preaching of Paul and like calling off your wedding because the day of the Lord is at hand and there's no point in getting married anyway. Imagine all the believers of Jerusalem who sold off all their possessions and lived in, you know, kind of as a commune, sharing all goods, who then came to poverty, believing that the Lord's coming was so soon that they had no need of any physical possessions. So this is not a, this is not a harmless do doctrine. This is not a harmless statement from Paul. These are very damning, very damaging things said by an apostle, to people who, many of them had the rest of their lives to live out, but took steps that were very unwise, very harmful to themselves personally, because they were told by an apostle that they were not going to live to see old age, that the Lord was coming soon. What went wrong? Did, just Paul, did Paul just never ask the question? 
And if it was understood that he had wrong impressions, why was he permitted then to put those wrong impressions in the book and then have it dispersed? Um, it, it really speaks against the idea that this is a document shepherded by the Spirit. If Paul is permitted to make these grave errors which affect people so deeply and then to put it to pen and to propagate it all over the Mediterranean and now finally globally, so that's just one Pauline anomaly. Somebody who, who spoke to Christ personally should have a better idea about the eschaton. All right, what else? Um, he makes basic errors in any discussion of natural history. And so uh, the natural world, so they, there's this basic contention that if God created the world and at the end of the six days of creation he calls everything good, but we experience the world as obscenely evil, that if you're not ultimately killed, um, if, if, if you don't die of old age, which is bad enough, you're going to be taken out by a disease, a natural disease, or you're going to be taken out by an earthquake or a hurricane um, or some, some other act of God or by some action of your fellow man. Something's going to get you. This, this world has in it with, within, within it a thousand ways to die. And so that's not good. That's not good. And so how is this dealt with theologically? It's dealt with in this way that Paul says that death did not come into the world until Adam sinned. And there, that way God is exonerated. We don't blame God. We get to blame Adam. And because we were all within Adam's loins, then we get to blame ourselves. And so... Uh, the fact that the creation, as we experience it, is not good. It might be beautiful at times. We might enjoy parts of it. But, you know, go outside in August and, you know, start splitting wood. And you'll very quickly understand that this creation is not good. It will burn the skin off your back. And we're told by Paul that um, death is the last enemy, and death will be death will be done away with when God becomes all in all. That's when Christ ascends to the Father, rules and reigns. That the last enemy to put in subjection would be would be death. Um, and it also says in the Old Testament that the lion will lie down with the wolf. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The lamb will lie down with the wolf. So that even the animals will uh, be at peace, that there will be no, no more predation. Um, Paul says that now the creation groans, waiting for uh, the release that will come when things are made right by Christ at his return. And so people have coped with Paul's understanding of death being a result only of the sin that Adam committed um, in Paul's day, 4,000 years ago, now closer to 6,000 years ago. People have coped with the fact that Paul associates the entrance of sin into the world with the concurrent entrance of, sin, of death into the world by saying that, well, it's only death in reference to man. But that's silly on a couple of levels. First of all, death is horrible whether it's applied to men or animals. Um, animals experience pain. And the, the simple um, cycle of predation in nature is such that if this is a reflection of the mind of God, then we, that's not a God we would want to know. Like, that's, that's psychopathy. Um, the bloodletting, the carnage uh, that goes on in the animal kingdom is not good. That's not a good. It is natural, uh, but it is not a good. And so you have to account for sin predating Adam, but there's the other problem that uh, we have human remains which go back tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years. And so the historic Adam, as you trace uh, the hundred generations between Christ and Adam, which is listed in the book of Luke, there's no way to fit tens of thousands of years into that genealogy. So Adam is a more recent, Adam's entrance onto the scene of history is more recent than the earliest death. And so... It's a basic mistake of natural history for Paul to say that sin entered into the world, or rather, death entered into the world by sin, and that sin 
and death only affected mankind, when it in fact affected the entire created order, and natural history shows us that this goes back as a phenomenon much further than Adam ever could be. And so the counter-argument to that would be, well, this is not a book of science. This is a book of theology, and so you cannot hold Paul to the standards of a modern science textbook. And I would say to that that Paul's theology hinges on certain facts of natural history being true. He makes statements of fact regarding natural history, the veracity of which is intimately connected with his theological point. So that if the, if the fact of natural history is false, his theological point is likewise false. And if you get rid of this idea, if you make null and void the idea that the fall occurred with the first sin, then you have gotten rid of the idea of original sin. And once you eliminate the idea of original sin, the entire edifice, the entire theological edifice of Christianity collapses. It really does hinge on this, and this is why people people don't think this is important. This is really important. This is really important. This is why in, people make fun of Ken Ham and Ken Tovin and all the other young earth creationists and think that they're fighting uh, this stupid battle that never never affected any piece of Christian dogma. Um, when in fact, the truth of the matter is, is that they're fighting the fight at the foundations. That if they lose this battle, they may as well find a different faith, because the question of origins and the question of the nature of the world and when did it become ordered upon predation and death, that question, if you answer it wrong, Christianity dissolves. They have to have it go, as Paul says, that death entered through sin, and that was just only 6,000 years ago. If it's not that, Christianity cannot be true, period. can't be. So moving on from that, um, and to recap, Paul misunderstood the eschaton. Paul misunderstood uh, basic facts of natural history, which makes his doctrine of um, original sin uh, flawed, if not erroneous. Um, oh, yes, yes, one last one. Uh, Paul calls God the Father unknown. A lot of people think that Paul is always referencing God the Father as being the God of the Old Testament, and I think a lot of times he is, but I think towards the end of his ministry, he's beginning to realize that the, whoever the Jews are worshiping is probably not God. I know that's a bold statement, but his gradual and then final total rejection of the Jewish faith, such that there are almost no redeeming qualities left that he's willing to countenance, means that he would also have to reject the idea of the Old Testament God. Or he'd have to, he's, basically he's retconning the Old Testament the deeper he gets into his, into his ministry, the more and more he simply takes all of the Old Testament as uh, figurative. It's all, it's all a figure. Um, Isaac is received in a figure of the resurrection. That um, the sons of Abraham, Isaac and Ishmael, they're an allegory. Um, that he takes the crossing of the Red Sea to simply be a type of baptism, that he takes the manna and the water miraculously provided in the desert to the Israelites. Well, that's, that's obviously the Eucharist. And so further, the further Paul gets into his ministry, the less and less Judaic he becomes and the more and more allegoric the Old Testament becomes until finally he's telling the, the Athenians, um, you worship this God already, you just don't know him. So let's read that text, because this is, this is really interesting. And I'll, you'll understand the point in a moment. So Acts 17, let's see. Verse 22, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him, I declare unto you, God that hath made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, 
neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing, the, that, seeing that he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell in all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are his offspring, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought to think of God. We ought not to think of the Godhead as like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. All right, so as a Jew, um, conversant in the Old Testament, he tells the Athenians they already worship this God. They already worship God the Father. He said they worship him under the name and title of the unknown God. Now, here's the problem with that. You have to be very ignorant of history to believe that the God of the Old Testament was unknown to the Gentiles because here in the first century A.D., this is... After the dispersion of the Jews, after the dispersion of Israel first by the Assyrians, and then the diaspora of the Jews uh, by the uh, Babylonians. So both northern and southern Israel are completely dispersed amongst the nations of the Mediterranean. Not only that, but in the first century BC, Pompey the Great invaded and took control of Judea, making Judea um, a Roman province. And the Romans were absolutely knowledgeable of who the Jews worshipped. Jewish synagogues were found all throughout the ancient world. There was a large percentage, like a double-digit percentage of the Roman population was Jewish. And so no one was ignorant of the Jews. This was not an unknown God at all. Everyone knew who this God was. Everyone know, knew who the Jews were. Everyone knew who they worshipped. So why is he calling... God the Father, in this, in this sermon, why is he calling him the unknown God? He's known by everyone. The reason that most of the Gentiles would not convert is because they had to get circumcised and then abide by all sorts of impossible dietary laws. Uh, nobody could become a Jew if he wasn't born into it. Um, even, even men like Cornelius, who uh, were, was a, what you would call a righteous Gentile, would not convert. Why? Well... As I said before, you, you, don't, you don't convert to Judaism simply by believing. You convert by becoming circumcised. Uh, that's a dangerous and very painful process. Uh, you would also basically lose uh, most of your friends and business um, connections because you could no longer even eat with people. If they had pork, you'd have to leave the table. So nobody became a follower of the true God without absolutely becoming a Jew. And so it was not unknown. This God was not unknown to anyone in the old world. Everyone knew who this God of the Jews was. No one became a convert, or very few became converts, simply because uh, the, the buy-in was so huge. The sacrifice was too great. Um, many, many Gentiles simply worshipped from a distance. All right, so it calls him the unknown God. That's not actually true. What else does he say? Uh, he is the Lord of heaven and earth. He dwells not in temples made with hands. But, but we do know, we do know that when the tabernacle and the temple were built, God's presence indwelt those buildings. And you knew that his presence was in those buildings because a, a thick, dark smoke and cloud would cover uh, the altar or they would cover the sanctuary. And then you knew God was present. Um, so uh, this is not consistent with the Old Testament. Uh, neither is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Well, but the entire Levitical priesthood was predicated upon God being served by men's hands, being served by sacrifices, which in the Old Testament we're told are pleasing to God because um, he, he appreciates the sweet savor of the burning flesh. That's literally what it says, a sweet savor unto the Lord. Um, he appreciates the incense, uh, the, the, the garments could not, for instance, the priestly garments 
could not be made of wool and could not uh, be conducive to sweating because God didn't want to smell the sweat on men's bodies because he was extremely well attuned to not only the service itself but who was serving him such that men with a physical defect, for instance, if you had a flat nose uh, or if you were damaged in the testes or if you know you had any sort of skin blemish, um, you could not serve in the temple because God was absolutely concerned with the service at men's hands and who was doing the serving. So already we're told it's the unknown God, the God who doesn't dwell in temples, the God not really concerned with being served by men's hands in spite of the fact that the entire tabernacle and the entire temple complex and all the sacrifices were all performed by men's hands and we're told that God uh, wanted these things, or des was desirous of these things. Already, this cannot be the God of the Old Testament. Paul has a completely di different conception of God. Even if he claims the Old Testament, um, he fundamentally misunderstands it, misapplies it, or ignores it, or allegorizes it away. Because the God that he's describing to the Greeks here in Athens is not the God of the Old Testament. If you, if you take the text of the Old Testament seriously... All right, he have made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Well, here we are, um, if you hearken back to Deuteronomy 32, verse 8, we're told that Elohim uh, divided all the nations up amongst whom? Well, if you read the Septuagint or if you read the ESV, ESV translation, he doesn't give all of the nations of the earth, these 70 nations, he doesn't give them to Jehovah, to Yahweh. He divides them up according to the number of the sons of God, so that each people receives as its um, as its patriarchal deity one of the sons of God. Jehovah, the inheritance of Jehovah is Israel, exclusively. Israel. So, God, the God of the Old Testament is exclusively the God of the Hebrews. He's not the God of the Egyptians. He's not the God of the Philistines. All right? That's the picture that the Old Testament gives. He has covenanted with the Jews. So when it says, He hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell in the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that's in conflict with Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. It's in conflict with the idea of Jehovah being uh, the patriarchal, patriarchal God of the Hebrews exclusively, covenanted with them exclusively. And then uh, the Gentiles, by and large, did not come into the fold of Israel. By and large, they were you know, slated for execution. So then he says, then he says, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. I just got, I just got done reading David, where he said that his enemies, his enemies wouldn't, couldn't even be saved if they called upon the name of the Lord, because the Lord wouldn't hear them. Um, God was very far from the Gentiles, so so far and so inimical that the practically the entire land of Canaan was slated for execution. So this is patently false if you read the Old Testament account. So who is he talking about? This is not Jehovah of the Old Testament he's talking about. For as much then as, as we are the offspring of, spring of God, we ought to, not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone or graven by art in man's device. In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained whereof he hath given assurance unto all men that he hath raised him from the dead. So, who is he talking about? He's talking about the father of this man that he raised from the dead, the father of Jesus Christ. Who is the father of Jesus Christ? By a strict comparison of this sermon to the Old Testament God of Jehovah, the father of Jesus Christ is not likely to be Jehovah. Who is the father of Jesus Christ? I don't, well, there's a couple of ways of answering this question. We can answer it like this. Who does Paul think is the father of Jesus Christ? As I said, Paul 
at, at the point at a certain point in his ministry he comes to regard much of what made up the old covenant as being illegitimate he says don't do, do not any longer be concerned with new moons and feasts he, he basically says that circumcision will damn you now he's inconsistent at first because he himself circumcises Timothy he himself takes part in a temple ritual for a vow um, but as he becomes more consistent, he comes to abominate uh, Judaism. He comes to abominate Judaism, and when he's describing who God is, it is more like a Platonic monad. It is more like the omnibenevolent, unmoved mover, first cause of Greek philosophical thought. Paul's conception of God the Father is far more Grecian than Hebraic. How do we know this? Well, the description that he gives is the same description as you would get from a Platonist or a um, or a Stoic or um, even a Gnostic by this point in time. The omnibenevolent transcendent father of all things in him we live and move and have our being that's not likely to be the same god that showed up in person to speak to moses face to face um omnipresence transcendence and um personal localism don't really go hand in hand but nothing that Paul gives in this sermon is indicative that it's Jehovah of the Old Testament. How does Paul cope with this? By allegorizing the Old Testament away. And we don't know the degree to which he believed the allegories, but he does say that practically every, every point important to Christian doctrine is allegorical. And most of these allegories, most of these types are pointing to Christ, which he views as the true fulfillment of everything in the Old Testament, which perhaps we cannot truly vouch for. So um, to wrap up, to wrap up, I would say that if, had Paul lived a lot longer, who knows where his consistency would bring him. Um, it does seem as though when the Jews, his, his continual preaching to the Jews bore no fruit, and yet those same Jews continued worshiping a God, it seemed to me that he began to believe that the God that they were worshiping was actually a devil. And so by the time we get to Revelation, we get this phrase that comes out of John. John, and I consider John and Paul to be extremely close in their theology. We get this phrase out of John, where he calls uh, those who worship as Jews, he calls them the synagogue of Satan. But when did they begin worshiping Satan? Like, when was that switch made? Or was that a conscious decision? Or had they been worshiping the devil for a long time? As Jesus said to the Pharisees and the, uh, those who, the, those who uh, claim Abraham as their father, they said that, that, uh, we are not a, we are not born of fornication. We have one father, and he is Abraham. And Jesus said that you are of your father, the devil. He was a murderer and a liar from the beginning. In his works, you will do. So, when did this switch come? When did the the Old Testament religion begin to worship a devil? I don't know, but it seems to be a truth that slowly dawned on the apostles, and not all of them, just a couple of them, fairly late late in Paul's ministry, late in John's ministry, they come to this conclusion that the Old Testament religion is actually serving a devil and that the true God, the Father of Jesus, is not really reflected literally in the stories of the Old Testament, and that's why we have to allegorize this whole thing. And that's why when we describe the God, God the Father of Jesus, it in no way is a reflection of what's described in the Old Testament. So um, if you are under the conviction that the New Testament provides you with a coherent picture of what Christianity is. It's like a how-to guide, how to, how to do church, how to have a Christian faith. Um, 
keep reading and you'll be cured of that. The New Testament is a document which shows uh, a cohort of apostles whose beliefs are in flux. And Paul and John in particular, uh, who taken together probably make up two-thirds of the New Testament, late in their ministries, they seem to be making a transition away from believing in the God of the Old Testament towards a position of believing that the God, the true God, the Father of Jesus, actually was not known. He was the unknown God. And he was only recently declared by Jesus. And that Judaism needs to be abandoned wholesale if we're to truly be followers of Christ. So argue with that if you want. I don't care. Uh, put it in the comments. Um, some people call this apostasy. I, I, you know, at best, it's a Marcionism. Marcionism was a, was a Marcion was a Catholic. Now he was condemned as a as a heretic, but really, who wasn't? You know, everybody was a heretic at some point. Um, Marcion Marcion was a Catholic. Marcionism seems to make more sense of the data, and so call me whatever you want. But um, this. I don't think you can argue with this without having to run roughshod over much of the text of Scripture. And so at the end of the day, if you have to, if you have to violate the, um, the, uh, the integrity of the Scriptures to prove your point, you're really at the same point I am. Um, I, don't, I don't think that the Scriptures can be utilized to come to a coherent picture. So um, be that as it is, I'll have more once I finish a few books, uh, but maybe not until maybe not, maybe not for another week or two.